Hello, friends and neighbors. Welcome to the first live interview I've ever done on the OB Farms channel. Uh, I am Ken Berry. I'm a family physician. I am a an amateur farmer and rancher, uh, but I promise you, you don't want to take any of my advice about how to raise, raise livestock on a farm. Currently, my learning curve is straight up. Every day I learn multiple new things. And so rather than listen to my advice, which I don't advise, I have one of the most in intelligent leading authorities on regenerative ranching in the entire United States with me here today. It's a great honor uh, to have him. Uh, let me bring on the right honorable Will Harris. Will Harris, welcome. You set that bar pretty high there, Dr. Bear. I wish you wouldn't, I wish you wouldn't do it quite like that. Uh, now, first, let's get out of the way that, that uh, some people accuse Will Harris and me of having an accent. We discussed this before we went live. We don't know what the hell everybody's talking about with the accent business. So rather than offend either one of us, don't pretend like we have an accent because we do not. Do you agree with that, Mr. Harris? I do. <laughs> you can just get right over that and get over yourself in the process. Now, uh, I have just finished reading your book, A Bold Return to Giving a Damn. And every now and then I'll recommend a book to my followers. And this is this is one of the, in the top five of all books that I've read that is is applicable to modern society to our current situation where we're at right now as a society as a people as a country this book is on my top five all-time recommendation list uh because of the message in it the practical advice in it and so i want to welcome you uh give people just a one or two minute intro to will harris where you came from and what you're doing now please I will, and uh, and so you know, our books in the top five is high praise. I, I, I'm flattered that you would say that. <clears throat> so uh, I am the fourth generation of my family to farm this farm in Bluffton, Georgia. My great grandfather came here in 1866, worked this land, followed by his son, my grandfather, followed by his son, my father, followed by me. And today I'm aided by two of my three children, young young women in their thirties and their spouses, and they they have given birth to five babies, which are the sixth generation on the farm. So I, I guess the interesting part of the farm to me, the most interesting thing for me is how the the first two generations farmed the land on a mile that was really focused on the the land, the animals, and the community. My father was the first generation post-World War II to really industrialize the farm. It became a monocultural cattle operation, pretty good-sized cow business. <clears throat> I went to the University of Georgia, majored in animal science, came back and ran the farm the same way for 20 years. And for the last 25 years, I've been moving back towards the multi-species farm that my great-grandfather and grandfather operated. Early in my, early in my medical career, Will, I had a, an epiphany. I, I became severely obese and pre-diabetic, and it occurred to me that the advice I was giving my patients was not, uh, not working for me. And so I had to revamp and redo everything that I thought I knew about the human body and human nutrition. And listening to your book, I, I feel like you had a similar epiphany at some point. Tell me, because you had a big cattle operation and you were doing the confinement. You were doing all the state of the art stuff, right? You were vaccinating. You were giving them all the rations and all the, the boosters and all the antibiotics. What was your epiphany? That, that that might not be the best way for the long term. What what happened in your brain that made you go, wait a minute? Maybe I'm doing this you know, I, I was a very, very uh, industrial cattle producer, used all the tools, and I I believed I was good at it. You know, my, my, I've been raised by my father, who was a very, very successful cattleman, and I, majored in animal science at the University of Georgia, and that's what I'd done. 
And uh, I had that same sort of epiphany that you had. I'm going to get used to that word, epiphany. It's a good one, ain't it? Yeah, that's good. That's good. So, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and it, it really, uh, it really changed things for me the first. And, and I think the reason it impacted me so greatly was the fact I was such an abuser. You know, I was, I was really over the top with all the practices. It's just not very flattering to say this, but if the label said put, give them two cc's per hundred, I gave them three or four. If it said apply a paint per acre, I put out a quart per acre. I was that heavy-handed abuser, which is probably what caused me to to, to rethink things. I, I uh, one one morning in uh, 1995, we were loading out a load of cattle to ship to the Midwest, and I had that epiphany, and uh, didn't had no plan of how I wanted to change the farm. I just knew I needed to change the farm. And I started doing it, and we've been changing for 25 years. Yeah, and I think having that that kind of just light bulb go off in your head, I don't think I don't think this is the right way. I don't think this is the proper way, the sustainable way. I think so many people who are out there talking about medicine, nutrition, ranching, farming, they are having similar epiphanies right now. Um, you're now, I, I, I posted this on Twitter and I immediately had a couple of vegans who love to nip at my heels constantly because I recommend that people that that meat is part of a proper human diet. And they said, well, even regenerative uh, ranchers, they give all their cows all these vaccines and mRNA and antibiotics. And so I want to ask you the controversial question right up front. I know you've got 10 species on your farm. You have cattle, you have sheep, you have chickens, turkey, rabbit. I don't know what all you got there, but I want you to be honest with me. And I know you've got quite a reputation for being uh, beating around the bush, being mealy mouth, kind of a lot, a lot like me. And I want you to put that aside and I want you to tell the actual truth. Your, your grass, your pasture raised, grass finished cattle. What immunizations do they get? What antibiotics? What steroids? Be honest. Don't lie. Okay, I won't lie. <clears throat> for, year, for years, I gave them everything my pharmaceutical dealer had to offer. <clears throat> and uh, when I had that epiphany that you referred to, I, I didn't give them anything. And I went without giving them, in, in terms of vaccines. Yes. Uh, and, I, and I did not give them any vaccines for several, several years. I guess maybe probably eight or ten years and i lost a few calves to black leg which is yeah. a, an indigenous disease in <clears throat> one year and, they, and it, it it made me uh wake up and smell the coffee so we do black leg our cattle but that's all that's all we give them and it and it's fine and, and i <clears throat> you know i don't know if i gotta give them out or not i just can't afford to lose too many and i you know so we uh we uh uh went for years without worming cattle. Then I started worming the ones that didn't do well, but then I get them out of the herd. I think that there's a genetic predisposition to uh, having, not to having internal parasites, but to not be able to handle internal parasites. Yes. So we, we handle that through selection. Uh, I, you know, the, for years, uh, Forever, we've saved females in our herd. You know, my, I guess sure. my, uh, my, my cattle go back to the cracker cattle my great granddaddy brought here in 1866. But my, I'm not sure if my dad or granddad started buying purebred bulls. I'm not sure when that started, but somebody did. And I know my dad always bought purebred bulls and really, really enjoyed that. And I bought purebred bulls till about 10 or 12 years ago. And I stopped and I, I started saving my own bulls. So I think that my animals are only exposed to this the, the part of a pathogens or parasites or other health uh, issues that are on this farm. And they are genetically predisposed to, to dealing with that. And I, I, my, I, I am very proud of the health of my herd. They are people that come here and look 
always comment on, on the health. Yes. Now, and so uh, you're, I want to get you on record here. You're, you're, you do not give your, any of your animals on your farm, any mRNA vaccines. And do you have any plans to do so in the future? No, I don't. I, I, I don't have any plans to give them anything. I, I'm, I'm generally aware of the controversy around mRNA. I don't know too much about it, but I know it's controversial. Yes. But I don't want to give them anything. I mean, we, we, we just do so well without it. Yes. And, and I think that that natural selection kind of immunity that we have built up here is valuable to me and important to me. And I consider it to be an asset in my herd. Yes. And I actually, my, my father has some cattle and they lost some cattle to Blackleg. We were visiting when that happened. And you go from a healthy, normal looking cow to a dead cow in about two hours. And yeah. I, I was like, what is happening here? And so you do vaccinate for black leg just because that's indigenous in Georgia. It's also here in Tennessee as well. Any other vaccines that your cattle get? No, just just, just what's in the black leg. That's just all. black leg. Gotcha. Now, what about give, giving your cattle steroids or antibiotics routinely to fatten them up or to make them bigger? Uh, do you do you do any of that at White Oak Pasture? I don't, but I used to, you know, I used to literally, I used to literally feed chicken litter, chicken, chicken manure back to the cows. I put enough corn and molasses to make them eat the chicken litter. And it, it is a, from a purely weight gain perspective and cost of feed perspective, it's a great thing to do. But I had to give them some therapeutic antibiotics right. when I was doing that, but I quit that. 30 years ago, 25 years ago. Excellent. So if somebody buys meat from White Oak Pastures, there's there's going to be zero mRNA vaccines. There's going to be there's going to be only one vaccine in the in the cattle. There's going to be no steroids. There's going to be no antibiotics. And I'm, I'm assuming that if you get if you have an animal that gets sick, you might treat them with antibiotics. But that's on a case by case basis. Is that correct? And it's sold outside the system. Yeah. They, they, and then they're they're immediately they're, be, they're invited to leave right after that. Yeah, that would be if an animal got injured or something like that. Yes, sir. Yeah. And so a rational use of antibiotics on a case by case basis, the minimal vaccines. And so when the when the vegans say something like, uh, and I, I have no animo animosity towards vegans. I understand they're they're on their place in, in their health journey. They a lot of them mean well, but they just don't know what the hell they're talking about in many cases. And so I just wanted to ask those blatant questions to you just so that we can get that out of the way uh, right off the bat. And so I thank you for being honest about that. Now, so you basically use rotational grazing and uh, culling the herd. If you have one that just keeps getting a dirty butt, they go to town. They and then they don't reproduce into the herd. And there, that that way, you don't reintroduce those genetics back into the herd. That's the, that's that's correct. And I want to comment on what you said about the vegetarians and vegans. And, you know, I have full respect for vegetarians and vegans. That's 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 a lifestyle choice. And everybody gets to make them. I do, you do, they do. No problem. There is a difference between a, a, a vegetarian and a vegan, and a militant vegetarian and a militant vegan. And vegetarians and vegans decide what, that they are not going to eat meat. The militant vegetarians and vegans have decided that no one is going to eat meat. And that is not okay. That, 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 and that, that, that's a, uh, I, I really feel compelled to make that difference because I do have people I care about that have chosen to be vegetarians or vegans, and I am absolutely in support of that. Yep. I will make them a tomato sandwich anytime. They won't. Absolutely. I feel the same way, but I feel like they, they've been so indoctrinated by some of the people that they listen to and follow that they, they think, Oh, Will Harris has got to be lying about this. He's, they, they said that they're doping them up with all these drugs and steroids and antibiotics and vaccines. And it's just not true. I, I have about almost 70 head of sheep here on OB farms and they haven't they have not gotten a single vaccine no antibiotics no steroids none of that and they're never going to definitely no mrna vaccines 
And I've got a, I have had a couple of ewes that just kept a dirty butt. They're going to go to town. They're not going to be able to reproduce. And, and, and you know, because I think you're right. I think that, that every, just like every human has certain genetic predispositions. Livestock have a genetic, some are just not as good at, at fighting the parasites internally as others. And so I don't want that genetics to go back into the herd. And I, I love how in the book you talk about the difference between having a relationship with the, with the individual animal and having a relationship with the herd. And I think that's a very, very wise and very strong way to look at this. Uh, you know, if we have a dog, I've got a dog I love and I know you do too. We have a personal relationship with that animal. And it's, it's personal. Like I, I'd probably come to blows with you if you were mean to my dog. I'd come to blows if you were mean to my sheep too. But I don't treat my dog the same way I treat my sheep because they, they serve a different role in my life. It's just like I've got family who if you, if you try to do them hard, it would be bad for your health, right? But then I've got close friends, the same thing, but not as strong. Then I've got acquaintances that if they got in fisticuffs with you, I'd, I'd be like, well, I don't know the whole story. I'm not going to get involved. And I think that level of involvement applies to animals as well. Yeah, we have animals we love, but we also have animals who work on the farm. And, and I love how you honor the herd. I think that's a brilliant way to put it. Uh, expand on that a little bit. Uh, explain to people who are not familiar with that concept, how, how is that different? Yeah, that, that, which, that whole thing you described has, has been very interesting to me. And I had to really think about it and figure it out because I would be in discussions with these really sophisticated non-agriculture people that were just very smart. And they would say, I just don't see how you can slaughter an animal that you have raised. And this doesn't sound very, very kind, but it doesn't bother me a bit. I expect to have to do that. Yeah, And it took me a long time to figure it out, but I finally figured out that they are, they are probably more complex than I am in just about any sense of the word, but not animal relationships. And, and the only animal relationship they've ever known was their relationship with their pet, dog, cat, bird, whatever it was. And that's, that's the way they thought animal relationships manifested themselves across the board. Here on this farm, I got I got a pet. His name's Judge, and he is right out there. And and I love him just like uh, a lady in a high rise condominium loves her Pomerania. No, there's no doubt, no no difference. Yes. It's the same deal. Uh, you know, I, if something happens to him, I'll spend a lot of money to get him fixed. You know, to, uh, but then I have livestock. And that livestock, I do not love the individual. I love the herd. It's like a, a river. It's coming and going. I love calving or farrowing or lambing. And I love uh, slaughtering the ones that are finished. I, I love that, that, that procession that flows through here. You know, I've got uh, working animals. i got... Uh, guardian dogs and herding dogs that aren't pets, and I have a different relationship with them. And I've got horses, and I've got wildlife, and I've got microbes in the soil, and just a very complex, loving relationship with all these living beings that are on white oak pastures, and they're all different, all very different. The way I feel about my wife and my daughter and my mother are different, same deal. Yeah. And it's, I think it's, I think the, the way you explain it is so brilliant because we all know there are people out there in the world just because they're a person. That doesn't mean we'd piss on them if they were on fire. We don't like them. We're not, we wouldn't, we're not going to go out of our way to help them, but there are other people that are very near and dear to us. And, but it's funny how people who've never been on a farm or been around livestock, they can't make that separation. This is a pet. This is a farm animal. That's two different things. And I think I personally think it's a degree of immaturity on their part that they can't make that distinction. But that may be insensitive on my part. It may just be that they've never been experienced. They've never experienced life on the farm and how it works. I mean, if you talk about a herd of buffalo in the wild 200 years ago, they, they, were, they were born, 
they ate, and then they died very violently. And so uh, the one thing that a lot of people who love to eat meat, they don't really want to hear talked about much is the dispatching of the animals. And I think you do a brilliant job of talking about that in the book as well. Let's talk about that uncomfortable subject and how that also can be a thing of beauty, especially when you compare it to the way animals are dispatched by predators in the wild. Yeah, so uh, uh, depending on the species with our, our cattle, it's, uh, we dispatch them with a captive bolt that goes into the brain, renders them senseless. The, the poultry is stunned with a stunning knife. You know, different, different, different uh, mechanisms for different species. <clears throat> and I feel reasonably good about all of them. Uh, I don't like it when people say, and they don't feel a thing. Well, no, I don't know that. I, I, I think it's as good as it can be. And I, I've been with people when they died, and they did not die uh, as easily as my animals do when I dispatch them. As you mentioned, I've had animals that were taken out by predators, and they did not die as easy as my animals that I slaughter when I dispatch them. <clears throat> but it's the best we can do. And, you know, all I can say is that I hope when I go, I go as easily as these animals that we dispatch on this farm every day. It's, it's, the, it's the best we know how to do. And if we figure out something better, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. And I think that's that's the, a brilliant way to honor the animal is to is to make it the best it can possibly be. And, you know, if, if people don't understand how animals die in the wild, there's plenty of YouTube videos of coyotes and wolves and, and lions and tigers, uh, you know, ripping a, a ruminant's guts out as it's still alive and it's dragging its entrail on the ground. I mean, uh, all animals are going to die just like all people are going to die. And so either they die with, with honor and with as little suffering as possible, or they can die the grievous death that nature has waiting for them. Now you mentioned farrowing. And so let's, let's go from the end of life to the beginning of life because so many factory operations, they separate the calves from the, the cows, the, from their mama very, very early. They farrow their pigs in tiny little metal crates. How, how, how do you go about the, the, the reproduction, the, the beginning of life on white oak pastures? Well, first of all, we don't do any artificial insemination anymore. I used to when I was a very industrial cattleman, I would buy semen and artificially and so on. You know, AI stands for artificial intelligence these days. Right, right. At the University of Georgia, it was artificial insemination. Yes, and now, you know, the vegans would call that uh, you were sexually abusing the animals. Well. <laughs> right, but you don't do that anymore. I don't, I, don't, I don't do it anymore, and I didn't feel like that's what I was doing when I was doing it, but I, I, I in retrospect, I do think it was wrong. You know, yes. we would, uh, I would buy in the case of bulls, I would buy, pay a lot of money to buy semen from these bulls who were literally freaks of nature. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they were not good, well-rounded, athletic, performing animals. They were animals that had a ribeye that big. Yeah. And, and it, you know, looking back, I don't know why I thought that was such a good idea, but I did. And because people I respected said it was a good idea, I guess, but... But that's what I did. I artificially inseminated, and uh, we were, and then for years before that, um, we had bought bulls, uh, bought purebred bulls from breeders, and paid a lot of money for them. And uh, for, for us, I, I, we thought it was a lot of money. <clears throat> and we uh, ceased to do that. Now we save our own bulls, and I love, and, and and they breed naturally back to the cows. And I really love that process. I mean, I yes. think. Um, I think I'm breathing in such resilience into my herds and flocks that uh, I just feel very good about it. And what about your pigs? How do that? How do you farrow them? Uh, in, in in the woods, we uh, 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 we have we, we furnish little Quonset hut buildings for the sows to go in voluntarily. They can or cannot, depending on what they want to do. And they they farrow. Uh, if we if we if we happen to catch them there, we'll sit with them and watch them and help them. Uh, but they 
they're on their own and they're outside and uh, and it, it you know we, we, we you know we don't have 18 pig litters you know a, a litter with 10 pigs in it's pretty good you know more like eight yep yep and so it it sounds like you're kind of replicating what happens to hog species in the wild when they get pregnant they find a comfy spot and they lay down and they have their piglets and so you don't take the piglets away you don't put the sow in the little metal cage you don't do any of that stuff on on white oak pastures no we, well, we do ultimately wean the pigs of course she has the next little pigs if you sure. didn't you would have a you would have a like like a cow would you know if you if you let cows if, if we we have bred the maternal instinct up so high in our animals that they won't wean the previous offspring we would have a cow have a uh, uh, 70 pound calf with a 500 pound yearling calf nursing competing at the teat right that, that, that wouldn't go well so we we do uh wean them but we wean them very late we wean them just in time for the next next step makes perfect sense but but there's no there's no step so you have to at some point wean the 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 yearling, but there's no early separation. You don't take the, you don't keep the sows in cages because that's another thing you hear very commonly, especially on Twitter from the vegans talking about this. And uh, I want to make very clear that I, I recommend that all humans eat meat because it is our ancestral food. That's the most nutrient dense and the, the most nourishing. I think meat is a health food, but I am also an ab, not in any way an advocate of CAFO of confinement feeding operations of of the the animal animal abuse that i think happens every day on factory farms and factory ranches I, i'm not a proponent of that at all but until we've got enough people like will harris in the world we got to eat something and, well, so and, and, and we've been we've all been whipped with that stick too much you know the uh, uh you're talking about on the animal welfare side and that's all valid but on the uh ecological side as well you know the uh the vegan community uh blasphemes beef and feedlot beef makes it so easy to blaspheme i mean it you know it is true that feedlot operations are, are horrible for the for our ecology that's just true yep so they have messaged that cattle are bad for the environment beautifully just wonderfully most people walking around think cattle are bad for the environment. And, and that's not true. It's the way you do it. If you, if you look on our website, whiteoakpastures.com, there's a, a, a study, ecological study, that shows that we actually sequester three and a half pounds of carbon dioxide for every pound of beef that we produce. We're a carbon sink here. Yes. Yes. And, and, you know, and we're constantly attacked for being uh, putting up too much greenhouse gas when the opposite is true. Matter of fact, uh, that, that study was done by an environmental outfit called Quintus. And they were hired by a big food company to come here and do that. They were here to do me a favor. But coincidentally, and they paid them a lot of money to do it. And then it surprised all of us, including me how well it turned out for, for our side. So while airplanes and cars and confinement feeding operations are absolutely putting carbon into the atmosphere, the way you regeneratively ranch at White Oak Pastures, you're actually sinking carbon back into the ground more than you produce. The, the same outfit Qantas actually did a uh, LCA life cycle assessment. That's what they call it on uh, impossible burger just coincidentally and you're not you're, gonna, you're not gonna believe this but they actually impossible burger emits three and a half pounds of carbon for every pound of impossible burger we sequester three and a half pounds so if you want to be carbon neutral for every pound of impossible burger you eat you got to eat a pound of mine to break even that's right. To, to even the score. I yeah. love it. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach out to Jenny and have her send me a link to that study. I'm going to put that in the show notes of this video. So if anybody 
doesn't believe what Will Harris is saying. There's going to be a link in the show notes. As soon as I get my hands on it, I'm going to put it there. There's already a link to Will's book and to uh, the White Oak Pastures where you can buy lots of different kinds of meats uh, with a discount code if you're interested. And one the My two favorite things that you, you sell are the Oregon Blend ground beef. I love that because Nisha hates liver. I, I like it okay, but I don't love it either. But she hates it. And but when you when you put the heart and the liver, I don't know if you put any other organs. We'll talk about that in that that ground beef mixture. It just tastes like delicious ground beef to me. And but and she therefore she's able to eat heart and liver without you know throwing up. And then the bone marrow that you sell. I love how you try to use every single part of the animal. And let's talk about that. I think that's that's one of the main ways a rancher can honor the animal is that literally nothing goes to waste. So tell me what's in the organ blend and then all the different w weird cuts that people may not be familiar with that you actually have for sale. And then with what's left of the animal, what do you do? Is that waste that has to be dealt with by the local um, uh, landfill or what do you do with the leftover waste after the slaughter? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I am very proud of that, and it works really well for us from an economic perspective as well. When I first opened my slaughter plant, it was just incredible how much heart and liver and kidneys and other consumable organs we threw away. We offered it for sale. We just couldn't sell it all. There just wasn't that much demand for it. And these different diets that have come about have really opened people's eyes. And now we sell out of that. We, 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 we literally sell out of those organ meats. And, uh, and I think liver, heart, and kidney are in that, that mix that you talk about, along with ground beef, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so that's all been real good. Uh, as far as how we handle our waste, uh, we generate, we, we slaughter about 25 cows a day. And there's lesser numbers of sheep, goats, poultry, whatever, pigs. And it, and that generates about seven tons of non-marketable material. We sell bones. We sell all these organs that are marketable. But you've just got some stuff that's not marketable, eviscerate, gut fill, whatnot. And we compost that. We've got a really big composting operation. And we... Uh, put that seven tons a day and compost it with uh, wood chips or peanut shells or whatever carbaceous material is available to us. People give us that stuff. So it's just, and the bones, uh, there are bones in there as well. But we compost it and uh, we let it sit a year. We, uh, we got a, a, a 35 acre field that's just full of compost and long windrows. It's kind of pretty to me. But we uh, let it sit a year, and this is just what I've been told but by people that I think know. If you, when it's fresh composted, it's very bacterial. And if we let it sit for a year, it becomes very fungal and it's better for the land. And we've got 3,200 acres of pasture uh, that, that, that's here on the farm, and then we'll about a thousand acres of uh, <laughs> uh, solar arrays that we graze. And we fertilize it with that compost that we make. And it, it is beautiful. I mean, it is just wonderful stuff. It's like, it's like a thriving, living medium. It's just incredible. That's awesome. And so literally every ounce of the animal is either used as food or turns into compost exactly like uh, an animal that died 100,000 years ago. They would be food for the for the predators and the scavengers, and what was left would would be food for the bacteria and ultimately the fungi, and it would go back into the soil to regenerate and renew the soil. Now, I'd love to see a study because you're you're grazing hundreds of acres uh, of sheep on under solar panels. I'd love to know the ecological impact of that because when you combine solar Plus, you've got sheep grazing the grass and also fertilizing the grass with their waste. How what a beautiful setup that is! Well, you you'll see it. Uh, we are now participating in a Department of Energy grant measuring that. It's measuring uh, 
and there's PhDs running the show. I, we just we just do what we're told. But we've sure, got sure. we've got areas that we don't graze at all. We mow it, and then areas that we run the sheep on, and then other composite kinds of deals. And they've got some really expensive equipment out there that monitors. 24-7, what's going on ecologically. And we're new into it. This is uh, just, I think we started in uh, in the spring, probably April or so of this year. So we, we will, we will, it's just a three-year program. We won't know for a while. But I I, I know, I mean, I know exactly what's going to happen. I, I can't quantify it, but uh, I know what's going to happen. I've, I've been doing it for 25 years. Obviously, the, the results are going to be very positive, no doubt about that. But I, I might, you know, some people got to see the black and white before they'll believe it. But what a beautiful blend of, of, of re renewable energy. People call solar renewable. I don't know if that's technically true, but it's pretty close. And then with regenerative ranching mixed in with that, what a beautiful blend. Um, your mo Another thing you talk about in the book is the effect that you doing this has had on your tiny, previously poor uh, rural community. That's that's something that Nisha and I are always telling people, buy local, shop local, support your local farmer, support your local rancher. And I think for many people, that's a trope that they repeat, but I don't think it's something that they feel really has a, an impact Give us the before and after of your small community yeah. there back when you were just a standard, you know, company rancher versus now. What has that done to your local community that that people support white oak pastures? I'm sitting in the middle of Bluffton, Georgia right now, which is in the middle of Clay County. Bluffton, Georgia is in the middle of my farm. Clay County was the poorest county in the United States of America in 2020. And, and the other counties aren't much better. Just, just, and the reason is because it was it, it's, it has only ever had an agrarian economy. It, it started, it, it was thriving prior to World War II. Uh, post World War II, the population went down. The industrialized, commoditized, centralized farming went up, and it, it just. And by the time we uh, started doing making the changes we've made. Uh, there was uh, the only business in town was the post office and it was open for half a day. They said half a day. I don't think they were there a whole half a day, but it, right. And uh, the, the newest housing, the newest house in Bluffton was built in 1972 until we started building some. So it was 30 years. The newest, newest house. We were the, we were the fastest growing uh, city in the, in the country in uh, 2016 and we built three or four houses. <clears throat> but it, it uh, uh, was just, in financial decay because the only industry was agriculture and agriculture had to centralize. So well, it's centralized. So <clears throat> the, the three things that we're proud of here is animal welfare, the regenerative land management and the local economic impact on the city. And for the first 10 years, it was just two of them. I mean, I, I never dreamt the, the impact on the town would move the needle. And I can remember the day that I had a visitor here and he said, this is a nice little town. And it surprised me. And I looked and I said, you know, it is a nice little town. But the reason is because I had gone from four minimum wage employees to a hundred and something, about 170 now, employees that make well above the county average. I'm not I'm not super proud of what we pay our people, but it's a lot better than the average in this county. And when you bring, and a lot of these people came here to be here. So when you bring in high performance people and, and give them a good job and pay them a living wage, they need a place to eat and sleep and shop and play. And we provided it. And this is, I tell you, I'm very proud of Bluffton. This is a nice little, it's, it's just, it's tiny. This is a nice little town. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Something, that's, that's yeah. something to brag about right there because so many small towns in the Southern United States, I grew up in Hohenwall, Tennessee, which you've never heard of. And I currently live in Holiday, Tennessee, which you've also never heard of. And 
I can't say either one of them is a nice little town right now, but I, my plans are to do much of what you did in Georgia to try to do that here in rural Tennessee and stimulate the, the local economy by growing what we're doing here big enough so that it can have an economic impact on the entire community. Uh, not, not even getting to the fact that we're going to be trying to feed the community. Uh, and yeah, think, yeah. Go ahead, Will. We, we got a, a, a restaurant that serves three meals a day, seven days a week. And we've got houses and cabins that we rent folks. We've got a general store and an RV park. And it's just, we, we have people just come here to visit. And that's, that's just always very pleasing to me. I, just I bet that's something that didn't happen back in 1980. Just go to Bluffton, Georgia, just to visit. <laughs> no, unless you don't need to buy drugs. We, 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 we literally ran the drug dealers out of this town. Yeah, yeah, because that's the only thing in a small southern town. If You you might have failed high school chemistry, but you're still cooking some up in the bathroom, bathtub <laughs> because, you know, you got to make some money. Yeah. Uh, but I think, for, I think for larger metropolitan areas, if I still lived in Nashville, Tennessee, I would definitely want to have three or four Will Harris prototype farms around Nashville because you mentioned 2020. We all remember what happened back around 2020. And all of a sudden, the truck stopped running there for a minute. And I think for a lot of people, that was a wake up call. What if the trucks, what if they stopped running and they stayed not running? It wouldn't be but three or four days to, to a, a bigger community would be in a world mm. of hurt. And so even for bigger communities, I think everybody, even in metropolitan cities, you need to be encouraging this kind of behavior, uh, maybe not in your backyard, but down the road. You want to have a guy like Will Harris raising real food real close to you. Because I think that this country is not done seeing catastrophic events. I think we've got some more coming in the future. And I damn sure want to be living either I want to be Will Harris or I want to be living right up right down the road from him. Uh, because if times get tough, this guy is going to be fair with you. And if you, he, he'll trade you meat for work. He'll, he'll trade you meat for value. But if you don't have a Will Harris within walking distance of you, you're in a world of trouble if the truck stopped running. And, you know, that's that's really uh, what I wanted for a long time. You know, we, why, why do pastures, you know, we have a, 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 a low return on investment and all that sort of thing, but it's okay. We're going to be all right. You know, we're established enough that we're we going to be, it's going to be fine. We'll be all right. But that's not what I wanted. Uh, I wanted there to be a lot of white oak pastures all over the country. Yes, and, and we we sell as much stuff as I need to sell. We, we need to sell about twenty five million dollars worth of product a year because I built all these processing plants and all these things that I got to have that kind of volume, and we sell it, but we ship it to forty eight states to do it, and that's not what I wanted to do. You know, I and I, I've, I, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I had to, uh, I used to really sort of get on the soapbox. I would I would uh, uh, try to talk people into, that's a little stated, but I would certainly support people in their effort to change the way they farm. And and, and I, I've sort of had to quiet down on that a little bit because I had, I've known people that went broke trying. So I really want that to happen. I support it happening. It's what needs to happen. But you know, it, it's it's got to happen with with uh, the support of the people. I mean, you, we can't you know a farmer can't do this without the support of the people. You can't you can't raise food in, in, in industrial farming. All kind of expenses are externalized. I could go on and on. That that huge. I'm, I'm 80 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. And that huge dead zone down there where they don't oyster anymore used to be a thriving oyster area, but the pesticides and, and chemical fertilizers going down the Chattahoochee River and the Mississippi River, the, the oysters aren't there anymore. Yeah, on and on, all these things that have happened, and they're going to keep happening if people don't manage the land differently. And yeah, I love I, that. 
uh, and people don't think about the external cost of, of, of doing it the, the factory way. And so most people are just focused on where can I get the cheapest hamburger? And that's fine. And, you know, I used to be broke as a joke. I'm sure you did too. And I had to buy the cheapest stuff I could get. And I get that. But what I'm, what I'm saying is if anybody can afford to do better, please begin to do better because you might be getting your hamburger for 50 cents a pound cheaper. You might be. Yeah. And that's, that's saving your family money. But what, what, what are the other costs? That huge dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, you think, well, that, I don't live near there. I don't care about that. You better care about that. And what about the, the, all the silt that, uh, that's basically moving New Orleans further and further out into the Gulf of Mexico because of all the erosion that's happening from all the monocropping where the dirt is naked for months out of the year. And every time it rains, there goes another hundred tons of beautiful, almost irreplaceable topsoil down the Mississippi River out to the Gulf of Mexico. That's a cost. And that's costing you whether you think it is or not. Now, you mentioned you want this to spring up everywhere, Will. You want there to be a Will Harris, multiple Will Harris's in every state of the union, don't you? I do. All right. Let's talk to the, let's talk to people who are watching this interview right now. Because I remember when I was watching you and Greg Judy and Joel Salatin and uh, several others, uh, Gabe Brown. I was like, man, I'm, I was hungry. I want to do this. I'm going to go all, all in. And it's not as easy as it sounds when you're listening to a YouTube video. It's not as easy as it looks when you're watching a YouTube video that's been edited and all the bad stuff taken out. It's hard. It's hard work. But I want you to talk to the beginner right now who's on fire. Like, I, by God, I'm going to be the Will Harris wherever I live. Where do they start? How should they start? take out a loan, FFA, what do they need to, what, what should they do and what should they absolutely not do? <clears throat> well, that, of course, that, that is a highly situational situation. I mean, sure. that, 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 uh, you know, the first thing I would say is that, I mean, do, do you have, do you have access to land or not? And that's, and that's a big deal. And if you don't have access to land, you got to figure that out. And there are ways you can do it. And there are ways you can uh, work with people other than go to the bank and borrow the money and buy the land. So that's just too situational to get into, but it, it is key. And where the land is is also very important. And there are area, there every 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 part of this country, every part of the nation, the world has an it has an ecosystem. It had an ecosystem before we started messing with it. And that ecosystem produced an abundance. And the abundance that you need to market needs to be something that is fitting with that natural ecosystem that was there. And we can talk a lot about that, but a lot of thought and time needs to be put into it. The next thing, so you, you got to acquire the land, you got to decide what it is you're going to produce, then learning how to produce it. And I, I recommend working with a farmer in your ecosystem. We, we have a intern program that accepts six or eight interns per quarter, four times a year. And we get 20 something applications. We, it, it's, it's, it's overbuilt. I'm not soliciting people to come here. Right. But, but people who want to farm should find an established farm in their ecosystem. If you're going to farm in the Midwest, don't come to Bluffton, Georgia to figure it out. That, 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 and, 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 and I tell these people when they come here, it's a three-month program. You're not going to learn how to farm here in three months. You're going to learn a lot, and you'll, you'll crack the spine of the book. But you're not, going, you're not going to be able to leave here and go to the bank and borrow money and farm and then, of course, the last thing is what you were talking about earlier is the market for it. And that is really the, those other things can happen fairly easily. Not easily, but fairly easily. But finding that market is a lot harder than it should be. You know, it's, it, and it's, it's harder than it should be because there's so many forces that you're struggling with. You know, there's imported grass-fed beef that's legally marked product of the USA legally. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. If you, 
if it's the product of the USA grass-fed beef, what are the odds that that's actually cows? Because, you know, the common sense person would think, well, that implies that this cow lived in the United States and ate grass its entire life. Is that true? Can we believe that? Uh, you know, the, the, the numbers aren't actually kept up with, but I would say that 90% of the beef that's marketed product of the USA with no further explanation is, is probably brought in from New Zealand or Australia or Uruguay or one of 20 other countries. So that's, a, that's a real problem. Uh, and, and it's, it's part of why I quit soliciting people to do this because it, it, uh, it really lowered the margins. Uh, you know, for those of us that had been doing it for a while, made it hard on us, but it made it impossible on somebody that was just getting started. Yeah. And so uh, for a beginner who's on fire to do this, think about your ecosystem. Where do you live? Find a find a guy who's been ranching or farming there for 10, 20, 30 years and what offer them free labor in exchange for, for their, their brain contents. Is that what you would say? And then also you implied, but you didn't say you don't have to buy the land. Because you and I were both fortunate to inherit some land. Not everybody's that fortunate. And so you if you've got no land, if you're living in an apartment right now, you can always talk to somebody about, hey, I'd love to lease your pasture from you. And that's not going to cost you much and, and get a lock in a lease on a pasture. And then if nothing else, you can just play around and experiment and see if this are you really on fire for this? Or is this just a, you know, a temporary pipe dream and then you're going to get distracted by some other shiny object and not want to do this anymore? If you've leased a pasture for five years, that's not nearly as devastating as if you bought five acres and now you're about to lose it to the bank. And make no mistake, uh, this, this thing we're talking about here is a, uh, it's a, it's a company that requires some capital. I mean, you, you can't. Uh, wake up in an alley and walk out in the country and get this thing started. It's not going to be like that. You know, you can't start a restaurant or car dealership or retail store without arranging capital. And this, and this is the same way. And it's, and it's fairly capital intensive. But there are a lot of opportunities if people are willing to, if people are willing to be creative in how they go about it. Uh, the the, 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 the hardest part today is finding that customer base. And isn't that sad? Isn't it sad that the hardest part of starting a farm like, like we advocate for is finding the people to take the health that produce from it in this food situation that we exist in? That's just, that's just so hard to, to deal with. And it's because big food has such a loud and powerful voice tricking people into believing that this stuff is fine. You know, my, you know, my wife is, 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 is of my generation. She's in her sixties. And if, if I didn't stay on her, she, she would believe, I mean, if it's in the grocery store, it's fine. It wouldn't be, they wouldn't have it in there if it wasn't fine. Yep. Now my wife has quit saying that because I, she, had, she had to stay married to me. But that is the mindset of my generation. And uh, the fact is, uh, it's, it's, it's not all fine. It's not. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, so if you could have a perfect world, if you could snap your fingers, what's the maximum distance from wide oak pastures you'd like for your customers to be for, be? Uh, from so that you would feel 100% happy and fine with with shipping to them would you if I would you ideally want it all be local where people would just come to White Oak Pastures and buy the meat and then there's there's Will Harris's all over the United States you don't have to ship to Seattle Washington and Los Angeles California anymore because I don't feel like that's doing the planet any favors you probably don't think that either but what's a what's a perfect world for white oak pastures look like in your mind and in your heart? That that is that is such a hard question to answer. And let me tell you why. I just got through telling you that this is one of the poorest counties in the nation. 
and I can afford to operate here, but I'm going to have to ship it a little further. Yep. You know, if you wanted to have a, uh, a farm that was in the perfect place to, to market, it's going to be in the edge of a big prosperous city where you can't buy the land. I mean, right. So there's a, there's all different shades of gray in that equation from snow white to smut black. <laughs> and so it's, it's going to be where you can survive. You know, we're shipping, I told you, despite the fact I don't want to, we're shipping product to 48 states right now, UPS, FedEx, yep. every, every, every five days a week, maybe six. And that, <clears throat> I, I don't want to do that. I want to be as local as possible. And I don't know, and how local that is depends on how many people eat it. You know, we, you know, we we sell. Uh, I've done this math of one. I don't know that I can remember it off the top of my head, but I've done the math of how many people I'm feeding. How many people? White oak pastures, pretty good sized farm for for this kind of deal. How many people we fed? And it's not a huge city. You know, I I couldn't feed. You know, Atlanta. To save my life. I mean, yeah. I, if, 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 if everybody there ate my kind of food, I probably couldn't feed Columbus, Georgia, or Tallahassee, Florida, or Albany, Georgia, or Dothan, Alabama, all of which are right here within a 50, 60 mile radius. So, you know, it's like you ask me how long is the string, and, you know, I don't know how long a string is. It's situational, but I do know that we need as many. And I'll tell you something else. So, you, you touched on this before, but I want everybody to be able to eat my food or food like ours. Yes. But people, you know, there are poor people in this country that can't do it. Yep. And and I don't know how we get it. I don't know how that needs to, to, to happen, how that needs to look. I, I, have, I, I have to bite my tongue sometimes. I have the visitors here on the farm and they'll say, well, I love what you're doing. I think it's wonderful, but how can you get it to the poor people that need it? I was like, wait a minute. You solve that problem. That's right. I, I, I'll i raise it. You're not going to have to raise it. You solve that problem. Don't put yeah, that on yeah. me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a farmer, not a, 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 a common a economist. Right. And you that, should, it's a very similar story in medicine. We have went so far down the wrong road for so long. People, people say to me, Dr. Barry, how are you going to get the American Diabetes Association to stop recommending this, that, and the other for people or, or the American Heart Association? I'm like, look, I'm just trying to help one person at a time understand what, how to get healthy, how to lose weight, how to reverse type 2 diabetes. I, don't give, I actually don't give a damn what the American Diabetes Association says. I, I have no interest in trying to change the federal government regulations and change all that stuff at the top. I have no interest in that. I have interest in helping one person at a time achieve their best health. And it sounds like, cause you, I would go insane if, and also I would fail if I were trying to change the federal regulations and change the ADA and the AHA. I think it's impossible. I think, <clears throat> I think some big things, big corporations, big government ent entities are going to have to fall down. And, and there's going to be little people hurt. And I can't prevent that. I can't help that. I can't do anything about that. All I can do is the best I can do with what I've got. And it sounds like you're in, a, in the same boat with me. I, I, yeah, no, there, poor people can't afford white oak pastures. And that's I mean, people buy the best uh, quality meat that you can afford, even if that's the, the five-pound stick of bologna from the, the Save-A-Lot you know, yeah. discount grocery if that's the best you can do, that's the best you can do for now. But when you can afford better, you damn well better do better. I did. I did. Uh, <clears throat> I did steal a little bit of money from myself a few years ago and started a nonprofit, a 501c3 called CFAR, Center for Agricultural Resilience. <clears throat> and the purpose of it is to. Uh, teach people how to do this. We, we, uh, we hired an executive director. She's a very a brilliant young woman. And, and we, we, we put the initial funding in, but since then others have helped to, to fund it. And she has uh, sessions here on the farm to show people how to do these things you're, you're talking about, you know, how to pick the land, how to 
grow the food, the animal, the whatever. We we our, our own own farm experts teach sessions, and we bring people in you know, to help with that. So it's been, I think it's been contributory, but it's it, you know it's it's not enough. That's just one that's just one effort. Right. Tell me this, Will Harris. What do you see? What's what's coming in the next three years, five years, ten years? What do you think is going to happen with the regenerative ranching movement? What's going to happen with with factory farming? Put on your prognosticator hat for me for a minute and tell me what do you see coming around the bend? I think about it all the time, and I don't know. I mean, it, it, uh, the things we're doing to the earth are, 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 cannot last forever. I mean, the, 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 the topsoil is leaving. The, uh, we talked about the seas are dying. The, we're exhausting the water, fresh water supplies. There's only so much coal and oil and potassium and phosphorus in the ground to, to dig up. We can go on and on about how different ways that this thing could end badly. But I don't think there's any doubt that, you know, we just don't get them to, to round up and, you know, the, the, you know just, we just so many, so many things that can happen that are adverse. <clears throat> so I know, and, and I know what needs to happen. I can't see how it's going to happen. I mean, I, I, I think that it's going to take a, a train wreck is beyond what uh, any of us want to see. And then we'll just have to see how the pieces get picked up. I totally agree. Agree with every, everything you just said. <clears throat> I feel like bad things are coming. <clears throat> it gets me choked up. <clears throat> I think people are going to suffer. And there's going to be little pockets <clears throat> around people like Will Harris who are going to be okay. But <clears throat> I don't know what the future brings, but I'm afraid it's not going to be good for some people. We're about done with this hour. I appreciate this very much. Tell people what you, what you, what's on your heart. What do you want to tell them right now? <clears throat> You know, I just I just want people to to look past the messaging that all this food is fine, just fine. Whatever the huge multinational food companies uh, present to you is what you need to be consume, buying and consuming, and look rationally and objectively at where your food is coming from. And make your own decision. I think that most reasonable people, if they can look past the messaging and see what's actually occurring, it's a no-brainer. Now, you, you may not be able to afford it, and I, I get that. But if you are a thinking, rational, reasonable person, and you can afford to eat differently, then you'll probably choose to eat differently. And I think you're probably going to have to go to some trouble to, 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 to get there. I think you're probably going to have to buy food from a little further away than you want. I think you may have to reach out to some local farmer and, and, and help them get started. I don't know how that needs to look. But there, there's got to be something of a partnership between people who want to eat better and people who are willing to grow good food. Yeah, absolutely. And with the dollars you have available, buy the best quality meat that you can afford. Meat is a health food. It is not a guilty pleasure. It's not a carnal pleasure. It is absolutely a, a nutrient-dense health food, ancestrally appropriate food for human beings. And don't let anybody tell you any different. If you've got a few extra dollars, find a local rancher. Even if you just buy a pound of hamburger once a year, that little bit of money multiplied by multiple people might be just the, the, the purchase that he needs to stop considering selling the farm. 
that may be just the thing that keeps him in the green, just enough out of the red so that he decides, you know, we're going to give it one more try. But I'm telling you guys right now, if you guys don't find local sources of food, local, local ranchers, local farmers, but other bad things are going to happen, guys. If you think that the COVID thing, that was just a one and done, there's more stuff coming up the road. And if, if your community is not resilient, because we've established supply lines break, that happens. And sometimes they stay broke for weeks or months. And if you don't have a local Will Harris or you don't become the local Will Harris, you and your family and your community, it's not going to be pretty. Thank you, Will Harris, so much for doing this. I can't wait to come and occupy one of your cabins and, and pick your brain for all your wisdom and knowledge. It's been an absolute pleasure. There's a link in the show notes to Will's book, uh, A Bold Return to Giving a Damn. And I just want to ask everybody watching this, do you give a damn? Do you really give a damn? Or do you just kind of half-ass give a damn? Because it's, it's going to matter at some point. It's going to start to really, really matter for you and your family. And then if you want to buy some of their delicious lamb, beef, chicken, pork, there's a link down in the show notes with a discount code. Will Harris, thank you. you I know I got to go back out in the rain and put up some poly braid right now because I'm moving the sheep today. And I bet you got some stuff waiting on you too, don't you? I do, but it was a pleasure being with you today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, brother. See you.